Welcome to Followers Worship. Let's start today with a memory from your childhood. Remember when you were in the school gymnasium in elementary school and the teacher would pick two of the popular kids to be team captains and then they got to pick their team members. They would begin by calling out the names of their best friends and then they'd call for the kids that they thought would help them win whatever game was being played. And when your name was called, there'd be a sense of relief mixed with gratitude and pride. And if your name wasn't called until the very end, you would know that no one really wanted you on the team. You, you weren't picked so much as you were foisted on the team. Well, today we're going to talk about how God picks you to be part of his church, a church that has some pretty serious issues right now. Rick says, the word church means the called out, out of sin and the world. But the called out are getting called out because of serious challenges in the North American church. But God takes care of his own and our role is to be faithful. To remind us how, we'll look at Ephesians and comparisons drawn by Paul to show what the church should look like. Time to see how we do when it comes to the Ephesus emphasis. We are the called out. We've been called out from the world and from certain death. We've walked through the waters of redemption and into eternal life that begins here. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope of no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over Chains. I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom he faithfully bore He canceled my debt and he called me
God calls us, and then we return the favor. We call on God, but maybe far too often when there's trouble, we seem to turn to him faster when we are in pain than when we are blessed. But good for us that he still answers. When I walk deep into the valley low Your faithful hand will guide and lead me on Oh good shepherd, come restore my soul And bring me comfort, bring me comfort When the world around me crumbles and falls I'm not shaken because you hold it all Let the glory of your power here be shown In my weakness, in my weakness I will come and you rescue me, my Lord Let no fire Your light has come to chase out the dark For I know my place and where I belong In your presence, in your presence, in your presence
worship, we find encouragement from each other. We learn through the words of songs and prayers and scripture, and we create a space for the Spirit to speak to us and move within us. But our primary purpose in worship is to honor God and to offer Him, as small and insignificant as it seems, our recognition of His worth and to say how amazing, how wonderful, and how great He is. my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the world thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art. I scarce can take it in That on the cross My burden gladly bearing He bled and died To take away my sin
Over the years, it can be easy to lose track of the meaning of something, including the definition of the church and what it should be. But listen to Jane as she shares these words from Paul when he wrote to the Colossian church about his love for the church and how the church, that's us, should respond to God. We always pray for you and give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will, along with spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray you will be strengthened with all His glorious power, so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people, who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. We often pray for ourselves and those we love, and yes, we pray for concerns that we see around our world, but we also need to pray for the church, both our group and the worldwide followers of Christ. And let's do that now. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we declare protection over everyone who is a part of this church. We lift up every one of their needs, Father, and we call everyone's needs abundantly supplied in Jesus' name. We pray and believe that no weapon that's formed against the church and the congregation shall prosper, and that any tongue that rises against them in judgment shall be shown to be in the wrong. We pray that you prosper the people spiritually, physically, relationally, emotionally, financially, in every area for your glory. Father, please remind the people to commune and fellowship with you daily and how important that time is. In the name of Jesus, we declare strength and a peace upon all the people now. May they do all you have asked them through your power that is within them. God bless every single person who is a part of this church. Thank you. Have your way in this church service, Holy Spirit. We declare that the word will go forth and that people will understand and what's planted in their hearts, God, will bear fruit to those who hear it. As a result, Father, this service is abundantly fruitful. We believe and receive everything we've prayed and give you glory in advance. For this prayer is answered. In the wonderful and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. These days we're surrounded by reminders. We have alerts and alarms on our phones and other devices that nudge us about doctor's appointments, birthdays, family dinners, and when to donate blood. We have alarms that wake us up and remind us when to leave so that we can get to our appointments on time. And we have a lot of other reminders around us too. We often surround ourselves with photographs in frames on the wall or just stuck to our refrigerators to remind us of family and friends and happy days. Reminders turn our thoughts to things we want to recall. In the Old Testament, God told his people to offer sacrifices and celebrate certain festivals all the time. The sacrifices were especially annoying. They were expensive and dirty and time-consuming, but they reminded people constantly of their sin 
and their full dependency on God. Today we have a different reminder. We come together around a communion table to remember our Jesus, and instead of being reminded of our sin over and over, we celebrate our salvation. This is a good thing to remember and to say thank you for each week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace and the redemption that we find around your table. And even when it is figuratively, the fact that we can meet around that communion table. And Jesus, we thank you for lifting the burden of sin and death from us. We ask that you bless these communion emblems for those who have them and let us take them in remembrance and in honor of you and the sacrifice that you made. In the name of Jesus, amen. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our blessing is a corporate one on the Church of God wherever you are, across this country and around this world. May the strength of God sustain us. May the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us this day and forever. I hope that God blesses you this week. And now here's Rick with his visual sermon called The Ephesus Emphasis. Say that three times fast. The North American church is hurting and critics say it doesn't have a prayer. 
In the U.S., most megachurches are half the size they were before COVID. Regardless of size, a third of all churches have lost a quarter of their people since 2019. The post-pandemic return to church has stalled across the continent, and it's clear lots of people aren't coming back. Some have moved to digital worship, but many have just dropped out entirely. On top of that, churches like Hillsong, Harvest, and The Meeting House have been rocked by scandal. Young people are leaving evangelical churches in droves. And in mainstream denominations like the Anglican and United Traditions, one Canadian church closes permanently every week. In fact, a new report says the Anglican Church in Canada could be extinct by the year 2040. Now, much of that is our own fault, but a lot of it has to do with changing social attitudes as well. In secular society, the Bible is no longer seen as infallible. Christianity is just one of many religions. People believe you can have Jesus without the church. And technology makes it a whole lot easier to keep commitment and accountability at a digital distance. And none of that is going away. It's a far cry from the exalted status of the church described in Ephesians, where Paul uses several metaphors to describe God's people and how we should live. So I want to look at those things to remind us of what's important and what it will take to restore the luster of the church. In the very first verse of his letter to the Christians in the Turkish city of Ephesus, Paul says, I'm writing to God's holy people who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. Holy doesn't mean perfect. It means set apart for the service of God. That's who they were and who we are. And then Paul adds, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. He adopted us into his own family through Jesus. And this gave him great pleasure. Since we're united with Christ, we have an inheritance from God, for he chose us. And the Spirit is God's guarantee he will give us an inheritance because he's made us his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Families offer love, protection, security, and a safe and nurturing place to grow up and reach our full potential. And so it should be with the church. God provides all we need, and we must extend those gifts to everyone. So the church is really about relationships between us and God and us and each other. It's about give and take, privilege and responsibility, with no room for mere spectators or attenders. We wouldn't consider it a family if somebody just showed up and used the house to eat and sleep. And it's not really a family if somebody uses the church just as a place to merely fill up and rust up from week to week. God wants us to have close, consistent relationships with each other, where growth and love are the keys. Every church should have a metaphorical doorway against which we can measure our spiritual growth to see how far we've come and how far we still have to go and grow. So just how much is the church a real family to you? And what do you need to do to deepen your relationships and do your part? Also in chapter one, Paul says, God has made Jesus head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It's made complete by him. It's a fitting comparison because our bodies can do amazing things, but only because the various parts are designed and organized to work together. So in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, each of us is a part of that body, that just like our physical selves, we need each other, and we must work together in a smooth, unified way to do what God wants. If the foot says, I'm not a hen, so I don't belong to the body, that wouldn't make sense. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But God has arranged every part just the way he wants. So the eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. No, we have to care for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. 
That's why we have to avoid spiritual weakness and disease, neglect, or communication problems between our head, who is Jesus, and the rest of us. Just think about how differently people would see the church if we were prone to recognize the worth and the talent of every individual, if we avoided competition and comparison, and worked together with one heart and one mind on things that really made a difference. And while I'm on the subject, if you're still waiting to see what God wants you to do in the church, take the initiative. Start with the small things and work your way up. Pray for opportunities and God will bring them. But don't think you're ever going to find purpose in life by sitting on your duff and waiting for everything to come to you. In Ephesians 2, the church is compared to a temple, and that's no accident. Ephesus was home to the temple of Artemis or Diana, the goddess of the moon, the hunt, and fertility. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the temple was four stories high and as big as a soccer field with 127 columns. A 30-foot statue of the goddess was the focal point and drew pilgrims from around the world. The temple was also a place of safety for those seeking refuge from punishment, even when it was deserved. So Paul tells the Ephesians about the one true temple, the church, where we find refuge from the punishment we deserve for our sins and honor God in return. He says, together we are his house and the cornerstone is Jesus. We are carefully joined together in Him as a holy temple for the Lord. Through Him, you are part of this dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. Now think about that. The church, you and me and all of us together as Christians, are where God lives. And we must communicate that by how we live. We must invite others into our lives so they can see God in residence there. Everything must be built on and around Jesus, and we have to let the Holy Spirit arrange us in the church exactly the way He wants us. Then God will dwell among us, and people will know it. Just imagine if people could see God working and moving among us in a more loving, real, and powerful way. Instead of the church getting caught up in real estate, doctrinal divisions, and harsh judgment. Simply put, the church needs more love, more unity, and more ways of ushering people into the very presence of our Father. So, what are you doing about that in your own life? In Ephesians 3, there's a tree metaphor. Paul says the church is to offer stability, shelter, growth, and life which are the things associated with trees in the entire Bible, from Eden to these cedars of Lebanon to the tree of life in heaven. Paul writes, Because of Christ, we can come confidently into God's presence. So I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources, He'll empower you through the Spirit. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you understand how wide, long, high, and deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ to be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. He is able, through His mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we can ask or even think. Glory to Him in the church forever. Did you notice that? Glory to Him in the church. That will only happen to the extent that the church is emotionally and spiritually stable, anchored by love, and offering real shelter and protection to those who need refuge in this broken world. We need to be a place where people experience together the love of Christ instead of just studying it to death. Really, who doesn't want to be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God? Sign me up. In chapter 4, Paul goes back to the church as a human body. Walk in a way worthy of your calling, he says, with humility, gentleness, and patience.
bearing with one another in love to preserve unity through peace. Speaking the truth in love will grow up into Christ Himself. As we're held together by every supporting ligament, the body grows and builds itself up in love through the work of each individual part. So our job is to grow up and build up so we can lift up the Father. And just like our bodies, our spiritual one will be stunted if we don't have the proper nourishment combined with enough rest and the proper exercise of our giftedness. Spirituality isn't about busyness. It's about purpose and living out your identity as a child of God through submission and service. In chapter 5, the church is compared to light and a loved one. After telling the Ephesians to avoid foolish talk and obscenity, coarse jokes, and sexual sin, Paul encourages us to live what he calls a life filled with love. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have the Lord's light. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what's good and right. Carefully figure out what pleases God. Don't take part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness, but expose them for the light makes everything visible. So be careful how you live, making the most of every opportunity in these dark days. Now, if you've ever been in a dark, scary place with no idea where you were or how you were gonna get where you were supposed to go, you've had a glimpse into how so many people live their lives. We need to offer them the light of God's love and direction. But more than that, we need to walk with them toward that life because life is a journey. In fact, that's the follower's motto, sharing Jesus and the journey. And to drive home that message of mutual service and submission, chapter five likens the church to a marriage partner. We are called the bride of Christ, loved so much that he gave his life for us. This is a great mystery, says Paul, but it shows how Christ and the church are one. He gave His life for us. We must give our lives for Him. It's about wholehearted love and commitment, and we can relate to that because most of us spend our lives looking for that. And last, Ephesians 6 says the church is like an army in need of full armor because life is a battleground, not a playground. If you think about it, an army exists to protect, defend, and preserve. And that's what we're to do with the values, priorities, and the will of God. We have to make sure the forces of darkness don't wage war on what he treasures. So Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Use all of God's armor to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth, the body armor of God's righteousness, and the shoes of peace that comes from the good news. Also hold up the shield of faith. Put on salvation as your helmet, and take the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Pray at all times, stay alert, and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. But having the right gear is simply not enough. During the American Civil War, General George McClellan's Union Army was well-dressed and well-drilled. But McClellan was better at organizing than fighting. He always had an excuse for not taking on the enemy. In fact, President Abraham Lincoln got so frustrated that he sent a telegram. It said, if General McClellan does not wish to use the army, I would like to borrow it for a time. Eventually, Lincoln fired his general, who later ran against him for the presidency and lost. Sometimes we too make more excuses than gains, even though God has given us everything we need to be a powerful force for good. But if we're too scared, too distracted, or too busy running our drills, we're never gonna fight the good fight or see the victory of good over evil. So we need the right passion, priorities, principles, and power. 
we need to stand against the things that break God's heart, like poverty, injustice, and exclusion. We need to stand for the important things like serving others and not getting caught up in budgets, buildings, and bravado. We need to stand with values like love, humility, and submission. And most of all, we must stand strong in the power of God and not in our own strength. We will never be a perfect example of a loving family, a healthy body, a magnificent temple, a stable protective tree, a guiding light, or a devoted spouse, or a powerful, victorious army. But the more we take on their traits, the more attractive and effective the church will be. And it all starts with each of us. You are the only church some people will ever know. So let God be seen in all you say and do. Because if enough of us do that, the Ephesus emphasis will become the followers focus, and we will never have to worry about living just on a wing and a prayer. Have a great week.